Hey guys, it's Chris here. If you're a fan of the podcast, then you're in for a treat. Unnerved is now on Patreon. This is a great place to not only support the podcast, but also gain access to all our episodes completely ad-free for just $1 a month. Check out our higher tiers for more exclusive content made special for the Unnerved community. Try it out and you can cancel at any time. Visit patreon.com forward slash unnerved podcast or click the link in the show notes. Your support goes a long way to keep this podcast going and I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Before we start this episode, I wanted to give a low heads up. This story contains graphic descriptions of violence. So if you're sensitive to that, Listener discretion is advised. Some of the names in this case have been changed to protect their identities. Enjoy the episode. He kept telling us that he was dangerous, that he was capable of like terrible things or something of the sort. Is that who attacked Donnie earlier? Like, what's going on? She tells me that Blake killed Philip. My heart sank. I'm like, what? From HV Studio, this is Unnerved. This episode is brought to you by Max, the one to watch when you have a dark side. Enjoy thrilling and iconic dramas like the new season of the HBO original True Detective Night Country and shocking true crime documentaries like The Curious Case of Natalia Grace. Unparalleled drama, unrivaled suspense, riveting stories. Now streaming on Max. Subscription required. Visit Max.com. Does Monday at the office feel like a storm? Not with Microsoft Copilot. That feeling when Copilot gets everyone up to speed instantly? It's sunny again. When Copilot simplifies complex data so your teams can act, that sun's shining on a beach. And when Copilot uncovers hidden insights, you're on that beach with your people and you find buried treasure. That's Microsoft Copilot. Learn more at Microsoft.com slash AI for all. Welcome back to the Unnerved Podcast. It's where normal people share their abnormal stories. And if you enjoy true stories of the strange and terrifying, then you're in the right place. I'm your host, Chris Fricky. At some point in your life, you've likely had a roommate. Whether you're in a college dorm or renting an apartment. Sharing the cost of a living space is ideal with someone that is trustworthy and makes you feel safe in your shared home. Perhaps you've lived with a roommate who at first seemed to be the perfect fit. But as time went on, that person wasn't what you expected. In today's story... Destiny shares how she discovered a rental property that appeared to be the perfect living arrangement. But not long after moving in, she found herself descending into a nightmare of violence and bloodshed. This is her story. My name is Destiny. I'm from Austin, Texas. I've lived in Austin since 2006. At the time of the event, I was living in Cedar Creek, which is uh, about 20 minutes outside of Austin. I had landed a job at a resort in Cedar Creek. The place that I was living at the time was in that area. Things didn't work out with uh, my roommate and I had to find a place like very quickly. So I was kind of uh, in a rush to find a place. I ended up finding a house on Craigslist. It was a six bedroom house. The landlord, he rented out rooms to individuals, so we all had our own lease. It was a mix of people, different personalities, on a piece of property that was, it was like 20 acres, 
uh, right by the river, by the creek. Uh, I could go fishing. There was a pool. Um, it just seemed too good to be true, and it was about 10 minutes from where I was working, which uh, was too good to be true. It seemed like a dream. I went and looked at the place, decided to go ahead and sign a lease and move in. And things were things were good at first. There were definitely like signs of concerning things that arose upon moving in. There was a variety of people living there. Having so many people living in one house that don't know one another, the social dynamics there can be a little funny. And it turned out that some of the people living there, they were just questionable characters, very flighty. Um, it didn't seem like the landlord was very thorough in his uh, evaluation of these people before they moved into the house. You know, I put a lock on my door. I definitely appreciate my privacy at home, so I tried to maintain that in this kind of somewhat chaotic living environment. Shortly after moving into the house, about a month or two after moving in, one of my roommates had moved back in. She had a long history living on the property and she knew the landlord for a number of years, uh, but she had moved out of town and moved back into the house. We ended up falling in love and dating. Uh, we got engaged, it was like a, it was kind of a fast track romance. I was in love, close to work. You know, it seemed too good to be true kind of at first. So as time goes on living in the house, there's people moving in and out of the house, like frequently. At one point, there was a guy named Blake that moved in. And I remember the day that Blake came with his family to, to look at the room. His family had come with him. Uh, he was raised by his grandmother and, and grandfather, as far as I know. Um, but they had come with him that day. They were really nice people. Christians, like very church driven, very friendly, super friendly. And uh, Blake was actually a very nice guy. He was kind of emotional, but very perceptive. Um, I remember the first time that I met him, he was like, he complimented me and my energy because I'm kind of an outgoing person. And he just, he was very, like, gave me many compliments. Um, just a really nice guy. You could tell that he was a little sheltered. It seemed like it was the first time he had moved out of his family's house. Like it was one of the first times he had lived, you know, alone as an adult. I was 30 and we were around the same age. So Blake moves into the house, he decides to move in and he, he kept to himself a lot. He was kind of, you could tell that he also uh, appreciated privacy. There was three levels to the house, it was three stories. His room was on the first floor, I lived on the second floor and then my girlfriend, Sage, she lived on the third floor. So Blake moves in and he kind of was the type of guy that played a lot of video games. Again, he was a really emotional guy. He was kind of constantly struggling internally with something. I remember there was a pool outside of the house and you know, one day we were sitting out there enjoying the pool and he comes outside to talk to me and Sage and he's just telling us about how he's just struggling internally. And we're trying to identify like what, what the problem was, like what's wrong, you know? It was really hard to like to pinpoint what the the actual problem was. You could just tell that he was having a hard time emotionally. Me and Sage planned a trip out of town. We were going to go visit somewhere that's kind of remote, go camping and just get away for a little while. And trying to be nice and help him, we invited him to come with us. And I remember he declined the offer and he kept telling us that he was dangerous. That he was capable of like terrible things or something of the sort. He declines coming with us, and me and Sage just didn't understand why he would say that. We kind of laughed it off at first. We thought it was just kind of like a ridiculous notion. He really did seem like a, like a nice guy, like a sweet guy. Owns the, owns the property. There was two houses on the property that he owned. We called our house the pool house that he rented out all the rooms. And then their house, him and his wife had a house that was probably about 500 yards away, but they only lived there part time. As time progresses, um, there's just certain things happening in the house that made me feel uncomfortable that other people that I'm living with just didn't seem to think that it was a big deal. 
things that were unacceptable in, in your home were happening that nobody else was addressing. Like, they weren't saying anything about it. For example, our landlord, Paul, had put in cameras. Like, he put in cameras everywhere, like outside, you know, on the porch, facing outwards. But then he had placed cameras inside of the house, like on top of the refrigerator. And whenever he started installing cameras all over the property and inside of our home, like, I addressed it. I was very surprised that no one else was addressing it with me, but I just felt like it was necessary. So I told him, Paul, you can't you can't have a camera inside of our house. Like, that's unacceptable. I think it's illegal. You know, you need to take it down. So events like that were happening, and I just increasingly was uncomfortable in my home. Like, the living environment, it wasn't healthy, very chaotic. It was almost like our landlord, Paul, would kind of fuel the drama. He would employ some of the tenants to do like odds and ends jobs around the, uh, the property. He would take off some of, you know, some of your rent if you helped out with certain chores. And he would use those as opportunities to kind of like stir up drama. There was a handful of times that things like that caused problems between me and my girlfriend. It was just irritating. It was uncomfortable. I didn't like it. I was very vocal about how I felt about it. And somehow, you know, the result was that, that I was the problem and that maybe I should find another place to live. And Paul suggested that I look into moving out and finding somewhere else to live. As time goes on and things get worse and worse and they're kind of, you know, climaxing and progressing, I ended up agreeing with him and I wanted to move out, but I needed to find another place to live. So around this time, Blake had moved out of the house. There was some trip that he wanted to go on, somebody special he wanted to go see, and he had decided to go ahead and move out of the house. I think he had been there for maybe a month or two. So he leaves and another, uh, the room was rented out to somebody else, a really sweet girl named Liberty. She moves into his old room and there's no vacancies in the house. The landlord, he allowed people to move their RVs onto the property, like right outside of the house. There was one RV that was like in front of the house, um, parked right out front. You know, they were given permission to come in and use the restroom facilities in the kitchen, which you know, it's already six people living in one house. And again, personalities that are just very, uh, just causing a lot of drama, causing problems. It's driving me crazy just because I'm trying to like have a stable life and I'm with someone who is affected by the drama and she's being sucked into all of this drama and it's causing problems between us. He had let another person put their RV around the back side of the house, which uh, we had no idea who this person was, who these people were. I didn't know what was going on. So that made me feel uncomfortable. I'm complaining about it. I'm being very vocal. People agree with me that it's kind of crazy and weird and uncomfortable, but um, I'm the only one really saying anything about it. Things are just getting to the point where it's unbearable for me to be there. Blake's trip had, he was wrapped up. He was, you know, the trip was, was over. He contacted uh, Paul asking if he could move back into the house. Paul lets him know, well, you know, your room has been rented out to someone else. I, I don't have a room. There's nowhere for you to live to move into, but that could change soon. So let's stay in touch um, and, and I'll let you know if we can accommodate somehow. He seemed like very eager to let Blake move back in. Like he really wanted him to, to be back. So he comes up with this idea to, to transform the living room and, and kitchen den area he wanted to build a wall in that room so that the living room would be shut off uh, for Blake to live in. And the first floor, whenever you first walk in the door, like to the right was two bedrooms, uh, one of which was was Blake's old bedroom uh, that Liberty is now living in. And to the left, it opened up into a big area, uh, vaulted ceilings, like it was the living space. And then there was a bar with the kitchen. So it was just one big area where it was kind of a communal space. So Paul has this idea to build a wall. Um, there was a maintenance man that uh, lived on the property that put up this makeshift wall. It was super janky. It was just like multiple different doors and like just random building materials that were left over from something else probably that were pieced together to create this wall. He tells us that this is happening and everybody's like, what? You're going to do what? Paul's building a wall in the living room? Are you serious? This is outrageous. So we're just kind of like standing back, like watching the construction go down and wondering what this is all about. I'm like, I've got to get out of here. I need, but I didn't have another place to move to. 
I wasn't going to like put in my 30 days and start packing up if I didn't have a place to live. That's ridiculous. So we knew that Blake was going to be coming back. He lets us know that he has a friend named Philip. He called Philip the prophet for some reason. I'm, I'm not sure why. And I guess it's important for me to mention that uh, Blake, I believe he was schizophrenic. I don't know that for a fact. He never told me that himself. I did know that, that he had a disability check. His income was sourced from, you know, a disability of some kind. Uh, he didn't work. That was, that was kind of how he paid his bills. It was something mental. Uh, I believe it, he was schizophrenic. You know, he would just kind of say kooky things, like off the wall things, like calling his friend Philip the prophet. And we're like, okay, so Blake's coming back, and I guess he's bringing his friend with him. So whenever he gets back and Philip is with him, he's introducing Philip to everyone, which is, there's a large group of people. It's like a whole social network there. And whenever he was introducing Philip to everyone, it kind of comes out that not only is he just his friend, he was like his pseudo brother. I'm not exactly sure what Blake's background and upbringing was, but it, it may have been kind of rocky. Something along the lines of being raised by Philip's family. Like at one point, Philip's family had taken Blake in so they know each other from being children. They grew up together. And that's kind of how he was in his life. Blake was my age, um, so 30 at the time. But he was a little immature. He kind of acted childish at times, had this boyish attitude to him. Philip was just young. He's a young man. I think he was 20 or 21. And you could definitely tell from his physical, you know, like physically he looked like a young man, like possibly even a teenager, and behaved like that as well. I think that Philip's uh, just com like manners were different than Blake's. Uh, since Blake had lived in the house and kind of knew all of us and had like established relationships with us, he was very courteous and you know, he would never eat our food out of the kitchen or, you know, he was very mindful and, and wanted to maintain those relationships. And when Philip arrived with him, uh, Philip, he had a different attitude about things. He just kind of, just like a teenager would, kind of just expecting things to be okay, you know, and not being courteous, not paying attention to certain things that he's doing that might affect other people. Definitely not very self-aware. And like I mentioned before, there was a creek on the property. There's a Cedar Creek runs through the property. And one of the residents of the property that lived in an RV, I'm going to call him Ronnie. Ronnie had lived on the property for about five years. He lived on the creek pretty much. He was always fishing. The day of the incident, Ronnie comes up to the house and you can kind of tell he's like out of it, like not a self. And uh, we're like, what's up? He tells us that he had went to go fishing on the creek earlier that day, and he can't recall what happened. He has no idea what happened, but he just woke up. He blacked out. This episode is brought to you by JLL. Get an insider view into the world of commercial real estate with JLL's podcast, Trends and Insights, the Future of Commercial Real Estate. Whether you're curious about making cities more sustainable, the evolution of office space, or AI opportunities, this podcast will help keep you a step ahead. Tune in for candid conversations with business leaders about the biggest trends impacting how we live, work, and play. Subscribe to Trends and Insights now at jll.com slash podcast. Hey, it's Kaylee Cuoco for Priceline. Ready to go to your happy place for a happy price? Well, why didn't you say so? Just download the Priceline app right now and save up to 60% on hotels. So whether it's Cousin Kevin's Kazoo concert in Kansas City, go Kevin! Or Becky's Bachelorette Bash in Bermuda. You never have to miss a trip ever again. So download the Priceline app today. Your savings are waiting. Go to your happy place for a happy price. Go to your happy price, Priceline. He blacked out. He woke up on one of the trails leading to the creek. He can't recall what happened. And his things had been rummaged through. Um, he didn't have anything of value on him. He didn't have a lot of things of value, I don't think. But he said that all of his things had been rummaged through, like his backpack had been gone through. But it was all still there. And he just has, he doesn't know how long he was there. He has no idea, like, what made him black out or what happened. He just woke up on a trail path. 
The day before that is whenever the wall was built in our living room. Blake comes back and there's so much activity going on with everybody that is just strange. I feel, I felt uncomfortable. Like I felt like I didn't want to be in my house and just like, this is ridiculous. So Donnie tells us that he blacked out on a trail path and you know, we think that maybe he was attacked. It sounded like he was attacked is what it sounds like. When this happened, I was like, you know what? I can't be here anymore. And I told Sage, I'm like, look, like if you love me, you will come with me. I just want to leave for tonight. Let's just go get a hotel room. I just, I can't be here anymore. This is so chaotic. Like, it's really affecting me. Like, please come with me. Let's just pack a bag and let's get out of here. We were both financially not really in a position. Like, we didn't have enough money to go get a hotel room. We were kind of hurting financially. I made such a big deal about it that she went and pawned some of her valuable things so that we would just have enough to get a room and I would feel safe and be okay. She was like doing it for me. We get enough money to get a hotel room. I just like threw a pile of laundry, like whatever, just in a bag, got in the car and checked into the hotel room. I guess everything that was happening didn't, she didn't seem as concerned about it as I did. You know, she had a history on the property. She had been there for like five years. And I think the chaos and Paul's creepiness and the weird things he would do, she was just used to it. Like she'd been there for so long, it, did, it wasn't as big of a deal to her. As we're in the hotel room, she's messaging some of the people that were living there. She was messaging Genevieve. Genevieve had the RV right outside of the front of our house. I could tell by the expression on her face that something had happened, you know? She looks like she's about to start crying, like something's up. I'm like, what? Like, what happened? She won't answer me at first, and I'm like, what's going on? She tells me, Genevieve just told me that, that Blake killed Philip. What? She's kind of like in shock. Is she literally saying that he killed him? I grabbed her tablet and I looked at the text message and I'm like, that's exactly what it says is Blake killed Philip. This heavy feeling just sunk through me. You can't help but wonder like, you know, what happened? What do you mean he killed Philip? Like, was there an incident? Is that who attacked Donnie earlier? Like, what's going on? There's so many things I don't understand at that time, like just trying to figure it out. It was just this really, like being stuck on an island, just cut off from things that are happening, but it's all happening in real time, so we can't get answers not being there. I knew that my intuition told me that this isn't, like, I can't be here. It shouldn't be like this. This isn't normal. I just, I knew that I had that feeling for a reason. And then it turns out that something like that happened. And I'm just blown away that a place that I call home is an environment for something so terrible to happen. She got that text message and that was pretty much the only communication that we had. She was kind of like trying to reach out to different people as time went on that night obviously the police arrived and there's an investigation a lot of the re the roommates were taken in for questioning there was a lot that i didn't know until two weeks after just how bad it was like when you hear that someone has been killed in your home that's just shocking right it's unbelievable i talked to sage about it and i'm like look like i can't be there like i couldn't be there before but i really can't be there now there's no way I don't know where I'm going to go. I'm going to have to just like figure it out and stay with a friend or in hotel rooms until I do. I wanted to get a storage unit. I couldn't really do it at the time. So she had agreed to let me put all of my things in her room so that Paul could be satisfied because he had been at telling me that I probably needed to find another place anyways. He was eager for me to leave. When we were at the hotel that morning that we were going to go back and I was just, I was going to stay focused on my, packing up my things, getting everything up to her room. I didn't want to, I didn't want to pay attention to all the things that were happening inside of the house after something like that happened. You know, like I was scared. I was scared to go back. We 
we finally decide to go back to the house. We're very nervous approaching. Whenever we get there, the landlord, Paul, was the first person that we saw as we walked through the door. When you first walk into the house, directly in front of you is the staircase that leads to the second floor and the rooms on the second and third floor. Paul was sitting in a chair, like dead center of the, of the doorway, like of the threshold. The roommates are kind of like active in the house behind him. Like you see people coming in and out of the living room where the murder happened with cleaning supplies and stuff. And Paul's just sitting in a chair, front and center. And he looks at us and says, welcome to my nightmare and throws his hands up. I could not believe that that's what we walked into after that, after someone was murdered in our home this guy who contributes to so much chaos and just an unhealthy living environment, there he is sitting dead center telling me, welcome to my nightmare. Are you kidding me? That, that put me in a weird headspace to begin with, being back there. The roommates were cleaning up all of the blood from the living room because police, I guess after they come investigate and all the red tape, once they take the body, they don't clean up the mess. So we had a very brave roommate that took on that task of, of cleaning up all of the blood. I was so dead set on getting out of there and just, just getting myself out of the situation. I was hyper focused on that, just getting out, leaving, moving out. I didn't ask a lot of questions, I guess. Uh, so I move out. Sage had decided, she decided to stay, which I thought was crazy. So I stay with a friend here and there. I couldn't like live there all the time, but they, they would let me crash at their place from time to time. And I was renting hotel rooms from day to day. It was not a healthy day to day life. So I decided to go visit my family, trolling Facebook and, you know, looking around online, this and that. There was a news article that I had found describing what had happened, describing the murder. That was the first time that I that I had read or found out how brutal this murder was. The article said that Blake had killed Philip by bashing his head in with a rock and then proceeding to to try and cut his head off with a knife and ultimately like shoving a sock or like suffocating him with something somehow. Like that's what had happened. He had pretty much tried to decapitate him. I just remember sitting on my grandmother's couch and reading this news article and my heart sank. I'm like, what? In a horrific murder in Bastrop County, a warning on this one, the details are graphic. According to an affidavit, 29-year-old Blake Vetter killed his roommate at the home they shared on Shiloh Road near Cedar Creek on May 31st. Sheriff's officials say Vetter admitted to hitting him in the head several times with a large rock, smothering him, stabbing him with multiple knives, then trying to cut off his head. Vetter now faces a murder charge. In a house just off of Shallow Road in Cedar Creek is where the attack happened early Friday morning. Bastrop County deputies found Philip Presbalak beaten and stabbed to death. Sheriff Maurice Cook told me the victim's roommate, Blake Vetter, was later found and taken into custody. Uh, it appears that they were friends up to this point. Uh, of course, you don't want friends like this, but nevertheless, uh, our indication are that they were roommates and they were friends. Investigators say the owner of the house where the attack happened rents it out to several different people. Neighbors tell me the property is somewhat of a communal compound. I heard things are a little screwy back in there. He, he takes in some homeless people, I believe. Um, but it's, it's close to home, you know. I'm, I'm a little worried now, but I can take care of myself. Vetter was taken to the Bastrop County Jail and charged with Presbylak's murder. A court date has not yet been set for Vetter, and a grand jury review is not expected to take place until next month, if not later. That will give investigators more time to go through the bizarre details involving this incident. The arrest affidavit was filed with the Justice of the Peace in Elgin. According to court documents, Vetter allegedly confessed, saying he hit his roommate with a rock, tried to suffocate him by putting a cloth in his mouth, stabbed him with two kitchen knives, breaking one, and then tried to cut his head off with a third knife. He has told us why he did it, but we are examining the truth of that. Vetter allegedly told investigators he got upset because Presbalak was snoring as he slept on a couch. Was someone taking drugs or using drugs? It's not a drug deal gone bad, though. Was he high? Well, that's something that we are yet to determine, but we do have uh, uh, some blood tests. 
When the case eventually goes to court, deputies are expected to testify that as they took Vetter into custody, he allegedly expressed concern for his roommate, saying there was no way he survived the attack. I'm shocked at, at the brutality. I can't believe that Blake is capable of something like that. Like, I, I couldn't believe. Also, I'm angry. I was so angry that, like, no one told me how bad it was. Like, how is it that I was living with a whole group of people that knew, they had, they knew, they had to have known. How is it that I was in love with someone, we were engaged, and no one tells me these details, something that happened in my house. So I was angry, I was shocked, I was in disbelief, and at that point, I started asking more questions. Like, I start texting other roommates, um, I start asking Paul questions, I start asking Sage questions, like, I'm looking for more news articles, I, I need to know what happened in, in my home. The night before the murder, me and Sage were in the kitchen. Sage is known for her cooking, so it's always like a treat when she makes something for you, like everybody's always excited to eat a meal that she made. And we were in the kitchen and she was making sandwiches. And I just remember Philip coming into the kitchen and he, it was, he was super meek. It was really sweet, actually. He asked Sage, like, you know, will you make me a sandwich? And it was almost like he was afraid to ask. And she's like, yeah, of course I'll make you a sandwich. Like, no problem at all. And Blake had come into the room as he's asking that question, and you could tell that he was, like, irritated with him for even asking for a sandwich. You know, Sage just tries to, you know, reassure him. She's like, oh, no, it's no big deal. Like, we're eating. Like, let's have, let's have a meal. And I just remember standing there and eating that sandwich with him. And then it's like the next day, like, wow, this, he was so young, like... It's, it's really sad. Nobody deserves that. I was told that the summary of that night goes as follows. Blake was increasingly frustrated with Philip for being disrespectful at the house. He felt like he was being disrespectful towards the roommate, not being courteous enough, and it was just like progressively getting worse throughout the day. Apparently, after we had left, um, I, I guess everybody kind of like split up. It was getting late. Um, so from what I understand, all of the roommates were home. Um, I know that Liberty was in her room. And then whenever it happened, they were in the makeshift room. Philip was asleep and I guess he was snoring loudly or something like that. And Blake just like snaps and starts attacking him and starts beating his face in with a rock and grabs a knife out of the kitchen and proceeds to, you know, try to decapitate him. And Liberty overheard everything. Like she heard weird noises and she was afraid and like didn't come out of her room. So Blake commits the murder and proceeds to walk over to Paul's house, which um, again is about 500 yards from our house. He's covered in blood and he knocks on Paul's door and he tells him like, look, like I, I just, I think I may have just killed Philip, my friend Philip. And Paul decides to just put him in the truck and drive him to his grandmother's house. Like that's how he decided to handle the situation. So he doesn't call the cops. Um, and his grandmother lived about 15 or 20 minutes from where, where our house was. And Paul just takes him over to his, his family's house and drops him off, covered in blood. And Blake tells his grandmother what he's done. And the grandparents contacted the police. So by the time Paul gets back to the property from taking him over there, the cops are there, everything's taped off, it's lit up. And, and like, that's how everything kind of transpired. So let's say that I hadn't freaked out and, and convinced my girlfriend to leave with me that night. Like, what would have happened? The sounds that, are, that my roommates described of it happening, like, if I had heard that, I would have come downstairs to see what's going on. Like, I know myself, and if something weird like that, if I heard something like that, I would definitely try and find out what's going on in my house. Like, who knows what could have happened if I had walked into that. And I'm just so thankful that, yeah, that I avoided that. I definitely will never question my intuition ever again. If my gut tells me something's wrong, I listen to it no matter what.
that fateful night, Destiny was fortunate enough to listen to her instincts and leave the home that quickly became a crime scene. Blake's bitter rage reached its boiling point, which led him to attack Philip, unleashing a brutal assault that left his friend's lifeless body on the floor of their shared room. Once considered a brother, Blake was now a cold-blooded killer, with his hands stained with the blood of his former friend. Destiny was not the only person disturbed by what happened that night. Due to the trauma of the incident and reckless actions of the landlord, Destiny's former roommate, Liberty, who was there the night of the murder, took legal action to sue Paul on the popular courtroom TV show, Judge Judy. This episode aired nine months after the murder. Paul Wallace owes for the return of rent and security deposit and hospital bills after she witnessed a roommate murder another roommate. Now, it was one of those men who killed his cubby mate that caused you ultimately to move. Yes, ma'am. And what you want back is your security deposit and your prorated rent for the month that you had already paid. Yes, ma'am. And what was your security deposit? $420. And on what date did you move out? I moved out on June 2nd. Had you paid for the month of June? Yes. How much? $420. And I have the check stub Not- and everything. You acknowledge that she paid the month of June? Yes, Your Honor. Now, there's no question that you are entitled to your deposit back? Mm Mm-hmm. You understand that? You understand that? Uh... You can't run a crazy house. You may be able to rent rooms, but you can't run a crazy house. You cannot cut a room in half, a kitchen, which is a communal room, move in a cot and let people sleep there. You can't do that. Respectfully, Your Honor. It was not a kitchen. It was a portion of the living room, and it was not a bookshelf. It was a wall. We built a wall. I don't care what you built. I don't care if you built another Berlin wall. If what you're trying to do is stuff as many people in your house as possible to make your mortgage, and that was not what this tenant bargained for, she had a right to move out, especially when she says you also had someone living on the property in a trailer. Yes. And when you had the most people in the house, how many people live there? Six. How many bedrooms are there? There's, there are seven. Seven bedrooms? Yes. It's a very large house. Do it's you a occup- three-story house. Just a, do you occupy one? No. You don't live there at all? No. Even better. Now, she's entitled to her $420 deposit back, and she doesn't have to live in a house where people are murdered. But I don't understand your lawsuit for $5,000. Do you understand? Yes. Um, Especially since you have no witnesses here. Yes, ma'am. Do you understand? I do understand. Okay. Um, I've been diagnosed um, with PTSD since the incident. What you have to do, if that's what you want, is you have to have an expert witness. Yes, ma'am. Which I you have, don't have. I have a diagnosis and my therapy bills. You lived there for a relatively short time. Yes, ma'am. How long? Less than a month. And where had you lived right before that? With my parents. So at any time during the course of this, you could have gone home. I mean, I did as, as soon as it was over, but my parents wanted me to deal with it on my own. So you had difficulty at home. I got it. You don't have to go any further. You have to give her her $840 back. Judgment for the plaintiff. We're done. I heard somebody being beaten to death, so it was very, very emotional for me. It took me nine minutes to get to the house. I arrived. When I walked past the kitchen, I heard him, I heard Philip snoring. And I immediately removed the uh, person. But um, later when I read the article, I realized that was him choking on his own blood. And I, I had to take care of the business of removing the, the person from the premises. They asked all of the roommates to um, go out on the porch. They basically, they processed the scene through the night and they stood out on the lawn. And then they went and investigated it and came out and told us that Philip had passed. In the end, the evidence against Blake was overwhelming. And he was ultimately convicted of first-degree murder. 
but the scars left from his heinous act would linger long after that fateful night, casting a dark shadow over everyone who lived in that house. The homicide that Blake committed is a haunting reminder to not only examine those around you, but to listen to your instincts when danger is near. Thanks again for listening to Unnerved. If you enjoyed this episode, as always, please share it with your friends and leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. It really helps the show out, and I truly appreciate it. And as always, if you guys want to see photos related to each episode, including this one, be sure to follow our Instagram at Unnerved Podcast. And for ad-free episodes and bonus content, visit patreon.com forward slash unnerved podcast. Special thanks to Ivan Bregovich for mastering this episode. Until next time, take care. <laughs>